All right, welcome to Conversations at the Computational Justice Lab. Uh, once again, I'm Greg D'Angelo, the director of the Computational Justice Lab. And on this edition, we have my dear friend, my frequent co-author, and uh, my, I will, I will call him my compatriot in running empirical workshops as well these days, Scott Cunningham, who is a professor of economics at Baylor University, as well as... Uh, I will call him a social media guru. Okay. He's probably very well known to even some of you listening and watching out there. So Scott, thanks so much for being with us here today. Thanks, Greg. All right. So um, as many of you might know, but if not, Scott uh, has a very unique area of research, one that we uh, share some commonality in. Um, specifically, you focus on illicit sex services markets, <clears throat> um, which is an odd area of research. And so I think the most natural place to start is, how the heck did you get interested in studying sex worker markets? Um, so I uh, got into, I applied to grad school because I read Becker's Nobel Prize speech and decided that I wanted to be an economist so I could study crime. And uh, that's what I ended up focusing on. In my dissertation, I focused on uh, the effect of mass incarceration on relationship markets, specifically African-American markets. And so I was already kind of thinking about this intersection of crime and risky sexual behavior. <clears throat> and inside, like, when I was reading that literature, I was, when I was writing that, that dissertation, there was a paper by Edlin Korn, uh, Lena Edlin and Evelyn Korn, uh, called A Theory of Prostitution. And it was on my radar because, um, the paper argued that like prostitution was primarily like a marriage market phenomenon, <clears throat> which was what my dissertation was about. And so, so I was like, that was in my head. I knew that paper, it published really well in the journal Public P Political Economy. So after I got my job at Baylor, I was sort of looking for a research agenda. And you know, my, and I knew I was working on crime, but I didn't really feel like a lot of my dissertation material was gonna become, you know, necessarily a research agenda. Mm -hmm. And um, one day this guy from Clemson named Todd Kendall, he contacted me and said, um, hey, I found this website <clears throat> and all these clients of prostitutes will rate the women. And uh, would you like to work on this with me? Because I think I can scrape the data. Back in 08, I'd never heard of anybody scraping. So, you know, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we hired a Baylor student <clears throat> to scrape it. We got about... I don't know, maybe it was like 150,000 unique sex workers and like 300 and something thousand reviews. So at the time, you know, you have to think back in 08, I mean, even today, really, I mean, that, there would never been a database of prostitutes that large, yeah. especially of the indoor market and especially the escorts. Cause like most of the literature up to that point had really been like, you know, unusually preoccupied with street prostitution. Yeah. I mean, like, that's a danger, that group is a very vulnerable group and they have a lot of problems and you know, so it's natural that they study them. But it was like, <clears throat> the, that focus had been purely driven by, you know, the problems in that community, but not this growing thing, right. which was, you know, this growing internet prostitution. And when I got the data, <clears throat> it was like, I could just kind of see in my mind like this one guy that had really influenced me a lot was Al Roth and his book on two-sided matching. And so that's like a big way that I think about the world is that book. And when I got the data, I just felt like I could see the whole story. I could see a story, you know, like I could see matching, I could see signaling, stuff that you and I have done mm -hmm. on signaling and screening. I could see, um, uh, the internet lowering the costs of providing the work by removing by removing the ability to get caught, you know, moving it towards indoors. I could tell this like I could see all these papers, <clears throat> but then I was like, I don't have enough data because all I really have is the erotic review, and so I was like, I have all these questions, and I, they're not in the erotic review, no matter how great that data is. So I decided to field a survey of seven hundred prostitutes that adver that are reviewed on the erotic review. I did that from 08 to 09, scraped Craigslist erotic services section as much as I could, got data, you know, the like the natural databases that you get in crime, the yeah. NIBRs and stuff. And so then I was just like, <clears throat> my goal was to be, and this is like hubris, I get, but you know, when you're a tenure track, you have all these like goals. Yeah. And so my goal was to be the world's leading expert on internet prostitution within five years. Like that was, you know, not prostitution not trafficking, 
just internet mediated voluntary sex work. Right. <clears throat> and so I just spent, you know, 12 years. You and I have worked on stuff. Me and Todd worked on a lot of stuff. Uh, me and Manisha Shaw have worked on stuff. And, you know, it's been like a really rewarding intellectual experience yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's in this area of work that there's, you know, in the economics profession, like five of us. Yeah. <laughs> there's like, it's, it's a really small community right. of us that work in this space. And we all have kind of shaved off just like a little part of it that we've made our own. And, and we've had a really collaborative group, which has yeah. been a lot of fun as well. And I, I, I remember meeting you a few years back and just kind of being like, here's my here is my long lost brother yeah. in the profession like yeah. here's the person who i can talk to about these things right so, um it's such interesting work it's a lot of fun it's amazing how much attention this research draws because so few people are working on yeah. it mostly because like you said the data are so hard to come by and when yeah. you do come by them it just seems like the you know i i get i'm sure you get emails all the time of people like hey can i have these data or, you know yeah. do you have this or that and so um you know, but the questions also pour in. Mm -hmm. And one of the main questions that pours in is should we be legalizing yeah. prostitution? You right. know, it's, uh, you know, and the arguments are usually incredibly emotionally backed yeah. <laughs> on both sides, I'll say. Yes. Um, and just fueled by a lot of misunderstanding, I think, yeah. a lot of the time. <clears throat> um, and sometimes fueled by... Uh, almost cult-like followings, or, or in some instances, religious followings yeah. of like, this is the belief you must have. But it, it, it makes answering the question of what effect would legalized prostitution have on social outcomes an incredibly difficult thing to answer. Mm -hmm. Yet, here you are, yeah. you were able to answer it. Uh, because as you and Misha worked on in Rhode Island, they accidentally legalized yeah. sex work. Yes. So... Again, it, 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 it just merits asking the question, how the, you know, how the expletive does a state legalize <clears throat> prostitution? How yeah. does that happen? Well, in Rhode Island, <laughs> um, the, the way that we understand it is that Rhode Island had poorly written statutes prohibiting prostitution. They were poorly written in the way that a lot of these sex kind of uh, statutes are written. They're very like Victorian. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they'll use very vague language. So they said, um, uh, it was like, what was the exact phrase? It was like, you know, indecent acts. Yeah, That's what it was. It was like, they didn't actually define prostitution. They just, de they just defined these indecent acts. Yeah. And that language of indecent acts had showed up elsewhere in their, you know, in their criminal code, <clears throat> and it included things like, you know, uh, fellatio between a married couple, extramarital sex. It was like this kind of phrase that, you know, had it was a problematic phrase. Yeah. So there had been a there had been a lawsuit brought against the state by a pro prostitution rights group called Coyote. And they were basically arguing, you know, that this was violating privacy, mm -hmm. this, this prostitution law. So at the exact same time, that was like 1976, at the exact same time that happens, there is this like neighborhood in uh, East Providence that is upset about street prostitution near where they live, near their residency. And they complained to the Speaker of the House I think his name was Matt Smith. I used to know all this stuff by heart. And it's like <laughs> Matthew Smith, a speaker of the House in the Rhode Island uh, House of Representatives. And they were like, they complained to him. And he was, by reputation, very responsive to his constituents. And uh, he was a devout Roman Catholic. <clears throat> and he helped pass a bill that made it so that street prostitution was no longer a felony. It was a misdemeanor. Now, the reason he did that was what they believed at the time was that they were arresting these women and then they were getting clogged in the courts. Mm. And so they thought if they just sped it through, yeah. they could like, you know, it was one of these swift punishment type things. Gotcha. So it did that. But there's this mystery, which is that when Matthew Smith did that, the legislative body, the, the bill that was put forth deleted that mention of indecent acts. And it looks like, I mean, my, my, my I'm not positive, but I get the sense that the, there were these two trains kind of moving and they knew, and I think Matthew Smith knew that if he could just delete that problematic language, that he would kind of, he would kind of make that lawsuit moot. Yeah. And so, 
So what he did was, so it was like in the section five of the lawsuit. So they had to like, it was a pro, it was a different, I mean, section five of the criminal code. And so they had to like basically butcher it because it was like everything was a felony. Yeah. Everything was being defined vaguely. So we're going to have to rewrite the whole thing, but yeah. we're not going to allow pimping to be a misdemeanor and we're not going to allow brothels to be a misdemeanor. They're going to remain a mis, they're going to remain a felony. So we're going to call, so, but they, so they start using very specific language. The felonies are going to be these things, but they pull out this other thing about the act of prostitution. Mm -hmm. So like now you've just got pimping and brothels, like the intermediaries that are felonies. And they create this new statute over here. It's like section seven. <clears throat> and section seven says more or less street prostitution is illegal. And so you used to have the actual commercial act itself being illegal, right. defined as that indecent act, yep. you know, which was problematic language, but at least the police could enforce it. <clears throat> now you've got two things that are illegal. You've got felonies against pimping. Right, the intermediary. Yes, yep. and then you've got uh, Outdoor. loitering. Yeah. And then eventually it was the crawling. So it was like the solicitation was illegal, but only it, it's very explicit. It's basically mentioning, you know, I don't remember if it exactly says cars, but it's basically outdoors, out, you know, out, airing your wares in public or sure. something like that. So that happens in 1980. And, you know, best I can tell, and I know it's, I don't think it's much more complicated than this. It does not appear that the, not, that the, the state understands that they legalized indoor sex work. Non- street prostitution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like, the reason I say that is because there's no mention of it, <clears throat> it gets no press. It passed unanimously in the house by this devout Roman Catholic guy who was doing it in order to address prostitution, problems with prostitution in the community. Right. Uh, you know, Richard Posner writes a book about sex laws in America, makes no, there's a whole chapter on prostitution, goes through every state's laws, does not mention that, you know, actually talk, he pulls out the actual statutes and makes no mention of it. Hmm. And he makes a big deal about Nevada's. Yeah. So, you know, and, but then the reason I also think is because in the late 90s, the police started arresting these massage parlor prostitutes and charging them with loitering. Right. You know, so the, and it's technically not loitering because these are, so that's what happens. There's this wave of, of yeah. Korean immigrants that come into Rhode Island, into Providence, and they are, uh, you, most of their undocumented workers, mm -hmm. for the most part. <clears throat> I've heard different stories, it has something to do with the IMF crisis, but, but there's definitely some migrants that can move into the community. And um, they are opening massage parlors, among other things, right? And these massage parlors are fronts for prostitution. Yeah. You know, they've got, uh, and so the, and they're, you know, really not affiliated with the traditional Rhode Island yeah. Criminal stuff. You know, it's like gotcha. it's kind of outsider stuff. So the police start arresting them, charging them with loitering. These women are undocumented. They have like this incentive to kind of plea out. But then what happens is that this guy may so one day, one of the women who is in a strip mall, in the same strip mall as this defense attorney, he's actually not a defense attorney at the time, he's a real estate attorney, but he becomes the defense attorney. And that's probably a key part of this. He also was not a part of this legal community. He's a total outsider. He gets um, brought into the case. She kind of contacts him and says, you know, what do I do? And he's a, you know, because I think, I'm working with this law professor at Duke about this. What we think is that because he was fresh eyes, he just, and he wasn't in the kind of like quid quo pro kind of relationships with the judges, you know, he saw everything new. Yeah. So he was like, he starts reading the law and he realizes, you know, technically uh, there was no law prohibiting indoor sex work. Indoor sex work. Yeah. There's, there's laws obviously prohibiting prostitution. So Rhode Island did not legalize prostitution. They legalized non-street walking, yeah. non, non-street walking prostitution right. by still prohibiting the pandering. And so, so he, he realizes that they don't. Long story short, he goes before the judge, argues it before the judge in 2003, and the judge has no choice but to rule in his favor. Yeah. And so it's not that like, so what happened with the judge is the judge basically said out loud, there is no, raw, there is no law in the state of Rhode Island allowing, justifying police arresting these mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. There is none. And you can see it in the data, and you can hear it anecdotally from the chief of police, they, had, they couldn't arrest them anymore. Yeah. They wanted to, and they continue to try to. They arrest them for other things. A massage that a license was right. one, but these weren't massages. So right. there was so no beg, massage. But it begs a question, and this is the one that people want to know the answer yeah. to. 
what effect does it have? Yeah, so me and Manisha, <laughs> we collected all these data. Sorry, that was such a long one. No, that's okay. okay. Yeah, it's so it's we great. collected all these data, the erotic review, uh, you know, the best data, what, you, what we needed for the project was, you know, annual measures of violence against women for all states. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of difficult to get, you know, unless you're going to work with the FBI's counts. Yeah. So we work with the FBI's counts of rapes and other crimes. And what we essentially find, I'll just cut to the chase, is we find about a 30% reduction in reported rapes, reported female rape offenses um, uh, relative to a uh, set of control states that look like Rhode Island before right. the event happened. And then we find about a 40% reduction in female gonorrhea incidents. Now, wow. what, we, what we think is going on with the female gonorrhea part, and this part uh, hardly nobody ever talks about, but like the female gonorrhea one is the one that is like a more, definitely a, an easier to explain phenomenon, whereas the rape one is a lot harder to understand. But the, when we look at the erotic review data, you can see that when they legalized prostitution in 03, there was this like sweeping in of new prostitutes, but they were like massage parlor prostitutes mm -hmm. and they were substituting away from very risky sex. Gotcha. They were like not engaging in the highest risk sex behaviors and they were drawn from a pool of women that had very low STD rates, mm -hmm. Koreans. Yeah. You know, and they, were, and they were in massage parlors. And so you've got more condoms being used, you've got a substituting away from very risky sex. So it's like, you know, these key people in the network are now being replaced with safer people. Right. And if you do that, it just becomes very inefficient for an STD to move through the sexual yeah, network. Yeah, absolutely. It just gets stuck at certain nodes, it doesn't move. Right. So we think that's what's going on, and when it gets re-legalized in 2010, you see all that stuff flip. Yeah. You, I mean, so you don't, you don't, we need more time to see what happens to gonorrhea, but like all of those things, you start seeing substitution back to the risky behavior. Yeah, it's fascinating. But the, but the rape result is, you know, the big mystery. Like, why did this happen? We find, we do not see any substitution of uh, police, you know, from working vice to working sex crimes, mm -hmm. you know, which you might think. We spoke with police, they say that never really happened. So, you know, there's not that. There's, uh, you know, there's no change in the definition of a rape. Right. So what we've kind of put forth as a possibility is that there is this marginal violent man who when, who has a very low willingness to pay for sex because right. he's violent. And uh, when the price of prostitution falls, you know, that guy gets sorted in, right? And he moves away, yeah, from violence. Wow. I mean, you know, it's there's we don't have proof for it, but we're sort of are speculating that that maybe something like that could that's be going the on. Story, yeah, that's really fascinating. I mean, it's it's led to so many additional studies for you as well. Um, and in a moment of of, of shameless self promotion, I'll bring one up. I mean, because a couple of episodes ago we had. Susan Athey here talking about the role of technology mm. in uh, the economics profession and the economics market. And um, I think that's one of the things that led you yeah. to ask more questions about. And so, uh, you know, what do you see in this very, you know, as you said, everything's moved online. What do yeah. you see as like the, the innovation or um, as far as a, a Rothian sort of yeah. argument, like this matching process, right. what has the, the role of technology done to this, this oldest profession in, yeah. the, in the business, you know, in the world? What has it done? Well, I think one of the more interesting things is a project that you and I work on that, not the Craigslist study, but a different one is uh, the development of signals and screens, mm -hmm. the way they're used. So, you know, the way that I think about it, a sex worker, has four types of men. When she meets a new client, there's basically four types of men. There's a man that's gonna show up on time and pay, you know, and that's like her favorite kind of client. He, he, do, he shows up, he doesn't use a, he doesn't waste her time, and he doesn't haggle her. Mm -hmm. The second guy is an unprofessional guy. He may show up intoxicated, he may be young and kind of rude, or he may have to haggle over price, and that she would rather not match with him. Right. Then there's a cop, and then there's a violent person. And the problem is, Ex ante, they all look exactly the same. Yeah. Right. So you know, there's all this cheap talk problem. Nobody can communicate their type. So one of the things that me and you found was in our in the survey that we did was, uh, and we kind of knew it was there because you and I had both been studying these institutions for a long time, yeah. but was this creation of these uh, references. Yeah. So uh, you know, when a 
a uh, new client comes along, about 60% of the internet mediated sex workers on the erotic review, you know, to be really specific, we don't know about back page and stuff like right. that, but among the erotic review group, 60% of them will require a reference from the client. And that means they need contact information for another sex worker that he has been with. And then they will contact that sex worker. Then they will read the reviews of that sex worker. Then they will read the reviewed reviewers' reviews of other sex workers. And they'll do all this kind of like recursive searching. And, you know, what you and I have argued is that, you know, these things are signals and screens. They're doing background checks on these guys because of the technology. Yeah. And because of the, the technology, they're also able to get references much more easily, the sharing of that information, and they're able to update their beliefs about it, whether these guys are bad guys right. or good guys. And so probably what the internet is doing is it's sort of allowing there to be more efficient sorting. You know, the, 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 the high types right. are matching with the appropriate, you know, women that value that. And then the women for whom are much more risk-loving, for whatever reason, you yep. know, they may be poor, and, you know, they might just be in a very difficult situation, they can't turn, afford to turn anybody away. Those women are probably matching with these much more mm -hmm. riskier guys. So it's probably, you know, the market is probably segmenting a little bit, you know, along risk yeah. factors because of the technology. And then there was lots of platforms doing the same thing. So, you know, we found at the Erotic Review that uh, there was a version of that at the Erotic Review called the whitelist. Yeah. Where clients could basically be in a list of approved clients, approved in the sense that another woman on the website vouched for them. Right. So that whole like way in which this fundamental problem of matching in, sec in illicit markets is being solved with the technology by providing information, credible information about the seller, as well as the buyer. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's all kind. There, yeah. there's credible information about the seller that you get from the reviews, and there's credible information you get from the buyer from these references right. and lists and so forth. I mean, I think like that has been profound. It's not that that stuff never existed before. It's just that it was like very selective amongst you know a small group of elite right. sex workers. Right. But what it's did is just moved to it moved to that margin like. Extensively, yeah. you know, like, and so I, I, my set, my belief is that for the voluntary sex worker, for the involuntary sex worker, it's a totally different right conversation. But like for the voluntary sex worker, you know, the probability that they're detected has fallen. They're not having to work outdoors. They can screen these guys ahead of time. They can like, you know, they, so they can not get, they cannot be discovered all of which is going to lower the cost of providing this labor, mm -hmm. and they can manage the risk a lot better, right. which is going to also lower the cost of it. Yeah. So, I mean, my sense is probably it's gotten safer, and by lowering the costs of the work, it's led to an increase in supply, particularly by women that would have never been a prostitute. Yeah. So my, my belief, and I, you know, it's hard to test this, but you can definitely see the profiles of the women changing over time. Yeah. You can definitely see in the the survey that we did, there is an unusually large number of college-educated women yeah. in the data. Yeah, it's a surprising yeah. statistic there. Um, so we're running short on time, but uh, I, I know for myself, and we talk about this often, I know you individually, uh, we get a lot of emails and calls from students and faculty who are interested in working in this space? It's uh, yeah. it's a that might be one of the more fascinating phenomena of writing in this space is uh -huh. that people are just so intrigued by it and they want to get involved in it. And it leads me to just think uh, hard about like what are the unanswered questions in this space right. and like or what's the most important, in your opinion, unanswered question in this space? So I'll I'll pose that to you. I think there's two. Uh, I think that. Anything regarding the measurement of human trafficking, it, true involuntary sex work is probably the million dollar question right now because, you know, um, that is the most difficult to get data. You know, you're not going to get it in a survey. Mm -hmm. You know, you're already having trouble getting stuff in a survey. You're not going to get it on there. Yeah, right. So, you know, that one's going to require some real ingenuity um, to figure that out because the work right now the empirical work on human trafficking has not been, of sex trafficking has not been particularly good. But with these new tools like machine learning and things like that, uh, using some of these, the, the scraps of data that we have, I think that we can make some real advances mm -hmm. on that. 
So that's one, and trying to figure out the effect of these of technology on trafficking and the effect of legalization on trafficking. I think those really are the public's questions. Yeah. You know, I mean, so that's definitely high. And then there was a policy that uh, President Trump passed last year, overwhelmingly popular, called the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, FOSTA-SESTA. had different names in the House and the Senate. And um, that one basically closed a loophole that allowed all these websites to flourish, right. like Backpage and the Erotic Review and a billion others. Mm -hmm. And um, massive disruption in the market. So I feel like right now, the, million, the other million dollar question is since that was, so, if, if I'm right, you know, and you might have these conversations that the internet has had really profound benefits to voluntary sex workers and maybe even to clients, if this event dis disrupted it, then you can test that theory, right? Right, And we should be able to see exactly what FOSTA did if we can figure out the right research. Yeah, for it. I, I, I totally agree. Questions. I couldn't have said it better myself. Those are definitely, I think that's the question sitting out there. And if you're a young researcher out there, um, you are in competition with Scott and I. We are trying <laughs> to answer these questions. Yeah, you every... might, be, might be smarter and faster, though. <laughs> you might be I'm faster. Uh, so anyway, we're out of time today for uh, this episode um, of Conversations at, the Computation, Conversations at the Computational Justice Lab. That is a tongue twister. I'm going to need to work on that. So be on the lookout for the next episode. You can keep up with us at our, our webpage. Um, and you can also find out about the lab's activities and projects by visiting our, our website, liking us on Facebook, and then following us on Twitter. And most importantly, Scott, thanks so much for being yeah, man. here. Yeah, man. Thanks All for right. having a good to see you, Greg. Yeah.